So you, we talk about uh, staff writers. We hear that a lot as um, people maybe outside the business. Um, I'd love to hear from your perspective, what exactly is a staff writer? You know, a staff writer, my first staff gig was there at Fame, which is here in Muscle Shoals. And in the 60s, lots of R&B acts were cut there. Rick Hall was the producer. He was one of the... Uh, engineers and architects of Muscle Shoals, as was my cousin Spooner. So staff writers were just exclusive writers. You signed over your publishing rights to that particular publisher. Mm -hmm. So like with Fannie, I signed a contract maybe like, I think it was for one year and two options. So it's in effect a three-year deal where it's, uh, Rick Hall can say, okay, year two, I'm not going to re-up your deal or, I, you know, he has options to get out if I'm not doing really good, you know. Right, right. So, but that exclusive deal, I give them my publishing at that point. I know there you can structure it many different ways, but they got my entire publishing portion. And of course, I kept my writers, songwriters portion. Mm -hmm. But the, these days I hear people doing co-publishing deals, don't you? Um, I've heard a little bit about it. Yeah, it's kind of a new concept. Um, I guess where uh, they they're not quite signing away all of their rights when it comes to being a staff writer, and I think that's exactly. maybe the best growth for that. Um, uh, maybe yeah. that should have happened a long, long time ago. To be fair, you know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because it it didn't happen too much back in the old days. But you're right. It sort of found its way in, and it seems like a more perfect. What? Yeah, and yeah. I mean, essentially, for those who may be hearing about this concept for the first time, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, but essentially the way it would work is a young writer like yourself would get signed to a publishing deal. You're essentially signing away your publishing rights to anything that you write while you're a staff writer exclusively with that company. Like you said, you still hold your writing uh, credits to that, and you can get monetized individually that way. But essentially what you're doing is if you're you know maybe you're not well enough off financially to publish your own self your own stuff you know by yourself independently you sign that away in order to essentially meet that part of your creative process and um it, it's kind of yes, like an advance yes. sort of right kind of like an advance it, it is an advance it's recoupable uh, against your royalties but you're right uh, say fame for instance they had a great studio we had great musicians so when I did a dem demo, and that, for the people that don't know, that's a demonstration recording. Mm -hmm. You make it sound just like a record. And we had the great studio, so Fame, that was part of their deal. They could offer me great, great sounding demos that sounded right. like records, which is in enhances, like I think, when a producer and artist hear a great demo that sounds like a record, uh, I, I think a lot of times it really helps because that quality that fidelity absolutely i think i think the session players and the the equipment and engineers and the things that fame has at their fingertips is definitely a huge huge advantage to a songwriter i think yep yes it was and also being in a company that's having hits they they were having hits like there's no getting over me walt aldridge was a writer staff writer there mm -hmm. holding her and loving you earl thomas Connolly. so also, uh, they were credible, you know, they were bona fide. So they were going out the possibility of me getting recordings and songs recorded by other people was high because fame was successful. Right. So exactly. Good, good company. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, that's, that's the gig to get. Like if you're going to be a staff writer, like places like fame and, um, and Mara music, and there's so many others, um, that, yes. that just come with that yeah. reputation for sure. Amen. Yes. So, um, a as a staff writer, you know, the way I pictured in my head is kind of like the cubicle effect that you see in the movies, right? Where you just have a room where there's just cubicles everywhere and you got writers lined up. That's the way I picture it. I know that's not how it works, but, um, first question is, is there competition amongst the different staff writers in the same publishing company, or is there more of a camaraderie effect, um, between writers? That's very interesting because think, thinking back on all the, the deals I've had, 
there really is an unspoken competition there because we're human beings. We're all wanting to get those big cuts, not to the point of where there's any really envy or meanness, but there definitely is that because that helps drive you to be better, you know, to compete mm-hmm. with the next guy and try to, you know, uh, but at fame, we had such great songwriters. Walt Aldridge was there. I think he was songwriter of the year, Chris, in 1981, country writer, because he had written Holding Her and Loving You, There's No Getting Over Me, and probably about 10 other big hits later on. But Robert Byrne also was there, and he had written I Can't Win for Losing You, Earl Thomas Conley, Once in a Blue Moon. So us younger guys, see, though, Walt and Robert were 10 years my senior. So me, Daryl Worley, do you remember Daryl, country artist? Yeah, absolutely, yep. He's my age. We were both at fame together, about the same age, looking up to Walt and Robert and sort of learning a lot from Rick Hall, too. And those so that, trickle, that trickle down, that you get that trickle down effect. Yes. Oh, my goodness, yes, yes. Yeah, just being in the, man, when I was, the one time I was in Muscle Shoals, we got to see Fame, and we, you know, we went to the theater, and we went to the different radio stations around there, you know, promoting the things we were doing there, but, um, man, it's it's so, such a rich history in that area, and as a music fan, knowing the things that happened there, it just brings goosebumps to your skin. I can't imagine what it would be like actually working under some, some of those people, or next to some of those people. Yeah, me neither. I was dreaming of it, you know, at age 10. Because I knew, knew my cousin Spooner was actually playing on some of those records. But there were, it's, it's almost like a miracle thing, Chris, because there were so many discrepancies that happened in so many of those sessions that normally would have derailed a session. But it's almost like they had to dig deep and find a way to overcome adversity Yep. in some yep. of those sessions. And it was just magical and like, you're kidding me. And as we go along, I have a couple of stories I'll, I'll share that, that I know. Absolutely. That. Please do. Um, so, sure. so how, uh, when you're working at fame again, this is a huge deal, uh, for a young guy, for any guy really, but especially for a young songwriter, you come in, your first cut is literally a top five hit. Um, so how, how, First of all, did the hit help you with your writing after that? And and really the concept I'm looking at here from you is like, was it, was it easier for you to get co-writers now, to get collabs or, or bounce ideas off of another songwriter simply because you had that first cut success? Right. You know, it did, it did help get other co-writers, but it almost wrecked my brain and my mentality. Because I was, I was in my early 20s, and I really, I don't, I wasn't ready for that big hit. So I tried to do cookie cutter Moon Over Georges. You know, I just didn't have the sense. I didn't have the experience to move on and write something, take the experience and write something different. I was trying to go back to the well because it worked for me. It's like conditioning, you know, uh, operant conditioning. I mean, it worked, had a big hit, so I'm going like the mouse, you know, going back to, mm-hmm. to do what worked. Uh, so so I, you think that wasn't... So as a young, inexperienced songwriter, you're thinking, okay, this this was easy. I did this. It went out there. It's top five. Yeah. You know, I'm a, perhaps, you know, you got a little bit of confidence going on. So basically, you're just trying to recreate the same magic with this in, within the same box, yeah. essentially. Yeah. And it did not work. I mean, it was like I had what's called sophomoric jinx. Yes. Where you do that sophomore year, you do good the freshman year, but sophomore year, you are kind of down in the the doldrums, you know. So I was, man. I didn't know what to do. And they were trying to even coach me. And I always heard this my whole life, right tempo, right tempo. But I, I was a lyric guy. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times you couldn't get the great lyrics in those tempo songs. So I'm going, I want to write great lyrics, you know? So I kept writing ballads and um, it was quite a while before I had another cut, Chris. I mean, it was a learning mm-hmm. curve that, you know, you can have a hit like that, but it doesn't mean you will automatically have another one behind it. Yeah. Complacency I imagine can set in and that's a really hard thing to drive away once it's there. You know what I mean? 
once it's there and then I'm like kind of scrambling. You get kind of nervous because year three of your deal, year four. So miraculously, I had Mr. Walt Aldridge there in the building five years after Moon Over Georgia or actually four, I went up to his office. You've been at Fame. He was in the upper office upstairs. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and I always looked up to Walt so much, even almost nervous sometimes, of like, here's my offering of a song title, you know, sir. You know, and yeah. uh, but he loved this one title I had. And I, I told him, I said, I wish we could write a George Jones song. It's called Like, like There Ain't No Yesterday. A d double entendre, entendre type song, and I've always loved those. I know you have too. The double twists. Yep. So and wordplay. So Walt said, "Yeah, wordplay." So Walt said, "No, I don't think we should write it really country. I think um, I, he said I just had a hit on this group called Blackhawk. Sure can smell the rain." Mm -hmm. And he said, "I've kind of got an end there with them. Why, why don't we rock it up a little bit and kind of do it like Henry Paul?" you know, and the band would do it, Blackhawk. And you know what? It, it worked, man. Uh, we rocked it. And it was a number, I think a number two yep. record. It was It was country. very, very, very successful, that tune. Um, and uh, Blackhawk, I definitely feel that. Like, I think they definitely made the song for sure. So that was a good call. Yeah. They did. So that was five years, though, like you're saying, you know, from me thinking, man, I had went over Georgia. Wow, Eureka, I found out how to do it. It was five years before I had another one. Right, and a completely different style of song as well. So, like, you finally got out of that box. So that's that's good to know. And then, like, um, 